I call the July 1st meeting to order. If everyone would please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance to our country's flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> With the clerk, <clears throat> conduct the roll call. Heidi? Here. Blinker? Here. Myers? Here. Reynolds? Here. Brown? Here. Allersmeyer? Here. Williamson? Here. Downing? Here. Campbell? Here. Foreign President. You have received the minutes of the June 3rd meeting. What is your pleasure there, Mr. Clinker? I move we approve the minutes from the previous meeting. Mr. Meyer? Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, the same sign. Thank you. Presentation and disposal of claims. There are none. <coughs> Presentations of petitions or communications. There are none. Reports of city offices. Clerk's office monthly May, fleet maintenance monthly May, water works department monthly May, water pollution control department monthly May, and police department monthly April. All of those uh, reports <coughs> are on file in the city clerk's office. They are available for your inspection anytime during the business hours. There are no ordinances for second reading. Ordinances for first reading. Uh, before we start that, a little explanation of those. If the ordinance is for a rezoning, it only requires one reading. The other ordinances do require two readings. I think that are any of them up for public hearing as well? No. Okay. So that's why sometimes you'll see us possibly recommend it for a second reading. First ordinance. ordinance. Oh, Excuse okay. me. Oh, okay. Go ahead. 2013-16, an ordinance amending section 8.07.030, the Lafayette City Code, weed and rank vegetation notice to owner. Mr. Heidi. I move for passage ordinance number 2013-16. Mr. Reynolds. Second. Any discussion by members of the Common Council? Yes, ma'am. Good evening. Jackie Chosnick, Deputy City Attorney. Uh, the Indiana State Legislature has made two recent changes to the state statute that authorizes municipalities to deal with tall grass and weeds. The first change is uh, allows the city to issue what's called a continuous abatement notice. Under our current ordinance, each violation of the weed and grass ordinance, each growing season, requires its own separate notice before the city can come in and abate the nuisance. A continuous abatement notice will allow the city to issue one notice at the beginning of the growing season for the first violation, which states that each subsequent violation can be abated by the city without further notice. Uh, in 2012, 134 properties received more than one abatement notice during the growing season. The second change to the state statute allows the city to amend its ordinance to provide for the serving of the abatement notice versus via regular first class mail as opposed to certified mail. Uh, it is allowing them to be served via regular mail is estimated to save a significant amount of staff time and resources and at least six to $800 of certified mailing fees during the growing season. What is the, um, if I say I didn't get it, the notice, how, how, do, how does the city have to go about proving that you, we mailed it? Well, we both mail it regular mail and then also as a secondary precaution me measure, the ordinance allows the city to actually post a notice at the property as well as additional notice. Any other questions? Thank you. Any members of the audience wish to address this ordinance? There being none, would the clerk conduct a roll call vote on Ordinance 2013-60? Heidi? Aye. Clinker? Aye. Meyer? Aye. Reynolds? Aye. Brown? Aye. Ballersmeyer? Aye. Winston? Aye. Downey? Aye. Ordinance passes 8-0. to zero. Thank you. Ordinance 2013-17. An ordinance repealing Chapter 4.09, Peddlers, Transient Vendors, Solicitors, and Beggars, and replacing it with new Chapter 4.09, Peddlers and Solicitors, and the new Chapter 4.16, Transient Merchants. Mr. Brown? Mr. President, I move that we hear and approve Ordinance 2013-17. Second. 
Any comments by members of the Common Council? Yes, ma'am. Good evening again. Uh, our current peddler's Say transit. Your name? I'm sorry. Keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I, I sat down for too many seconds. Right? Okay. Uh, Jackie Chosnick, Deputy City Attorney. Uh, our current peddler's transient vendor solicitor's ordinance. Um, hasn't been updated by the Common Council since 1981, and a majority of the language actually dates back to the 1960s. Uh, the current ordinance has proven difficult at times to both interpret and implement. Uh, this has been on my to-do list for some time to look at revising the ordinance, bring it kind of into modern times, clarify some of the issues that have come up. Uh, the new ordinance will actually break the licensing of peddlers and solicitors into one chapter and the licensing of transient merchants into a separate chapter. Right now they're all kind of meshed uh, together. Um, a peddler or solicitor is someone that goes either door to door, usually on behalf of a business or on or within the streets of the city of Lafayette to sell goods or services. Um, under our new ordinance, peddlers and solicitors are still required to be licensed. We're not changing anything with that, but the new ordinance clarifies what information must be in the application, what circumstances it can be denied, also actually clarifies the code of conduct to be, um, to be honored when uh, someone is going about the business of peddling or soliciting. For example, the new ordinance says that door-to-door -door sales can only take place between the hours of 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. Uh, a transient merchant, by contrast, is someone that engages in a temporary business. Uh, for example, would be someone who sets up to sell fireworks during the month of June and July, either in a, a tent on a parking lot or a temporary storefront. Again, the, we've always required those types of merchants to be licensed. The revised ordinance just updates, clarifies what information needs to be in the application. Um, prior to submitting the revised ordinance to you, it has been reviewed by all the departments that deal with licensing enforcement, the police department, the controller's office, and the engineer's office have all had a chance to review it. Any questions, uh, Ms. Chosnick? Mr. Klinker? So if somebody, I think you covered this in caucus, but I just want to make sure I understand. Um, if someone comes to your door selling magazines and they're not for a local high school, whatever, someone that's from out of town, they must have, you can ask to see their license Absolutely. if this passes. Absolutely. You are, they are required to carry their license on them and they are required to show it to someone if requested. And, and yes, there is, you touched on it, there is an exemption for, for example, the local Girl Scout troop that is going door to door selling cookies or some other local civic or charitable organization. They need no license. They need no license. Okay. Just a couple questions on the first part, the peddler and the solicitors. Is there a, you, you indicated 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., is that for both the peddler and solicitors and the transient merchants? Uh, no, that is just for the peddlers and solicitors. A transient merchant, since they're not really going door to door, they're just kind of a storefront. Um, there's no regulation in there for their hours of operation. And then for the peddlers and solicitors, is, there, is the license only good for a period of time, like 60 days, 90 days? And the proposed ordinance has a time period of uh, six months. And then follow up to the question I asked in caucus, is there any value to including language in here about exemptions? It says exemptions for charitable or other civic nonprofit. Is there any value to insert the word religious just to make sure that we're not prohibiting any religious? Oh, oh. Well, I mean, we certainly could consider it, but the way that the definition of a peddler or solicitor is defined, it's someone engaged in commerce. You're selling a service, you're selling a good. Someone who's just distributing information right. wouldn't fit within that definition. Okay. All right. Doesn't stop them from being able to knock on the door and invite you into no, church. No, it does not prevent something. anyone's First Amendment rights. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Dowling. There is uh, just one license given uh, several times in the past years, and I've gotten some calls on it of uh, kids selling candy. And they, they say the <clears throat> gentleman that has the license is in a van running around somewhere. So you tell him no, of course. But what's the procedure? Should you call it in to the police at that time? or? Uh, yeah, if there's someone that's going... I feel sorry for the kid. And, the kid's looking at you and he's gone. Darn it. <laughs> There is a procedure in the ordinance to uh, revoke a license um, based on violations of the ordinance or some other complaint. Is it one person, one license? Is one person, one license, yes. So if you, got so if you have a business, let's say an alarm company that's come in town and they're putting 15 uh, solicitors on the street, each one of those solicitors is required to have their own independent license, uh, submit their own application with the relevant information and be subject to approval or disapproval. 
just for the benefit of the public to follow up on what Bob said, when people do suspect a violation, your recommendation is to call the police department. Either the police department or the controller's office, yes. Yeah. That uh, satisfy you, uh, Mr. Dow? Any other questions? Mr. Ma uh, Klinker. And then somebody mentioned in the caucus also that if uh, somebody comes around for a utilities company or something trying to get you signed a petition, sometimes they will ask for a donation as well. That is, that's not selling something that's asking for a donation, so are they clear from that or? Well, if they are, I mean, the, the exemption for soliciting for donations and, and well, the, the exemption that you're thinking about for the utility company I think is actually separate because what there is is there's a new state law that actually goes into effect today that allows the IURC to grant what's called direct marketing authority to um, basically door-to-door -door salesmen for video service providers and that is the new um, state legislation which is why it's exempted from our regulation. We cannot require someone to obtain a license or pay a permit fee if they've been given direct marketing authority from the IURC. But if somebody says I'm whatever, environmental or pro coal or whatever, and they say they ask for a donation as well. Right. I mean they're not they're not selling a good or service. So I don't think right. that they would fall I mean if they were going door to door selling something in order to raise money for their cause then that would be protect different. anything in the future. So if you give it to them the money's gone and you're you know it. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions by members of the audience? And would the clerk conduct a roll call vote on Ordinance 2013-17? Heidi? Aye. Clinker? Aye. Meyer? Aye. Reynolds? Aye. Brown? Aye. Aldersmeyer? Aye. Williamson? Aye. Downing? Aye. Ordinance passes 8 to 0. Ordinance 2013-18. Ordinance authorizing the City of Lafayette to issue its Taxable Economic Development Revenue Bond Series 2013 LUA project and approving other actions in respect thereto. Any comments by members of the Common Council? Yes, sir. Move to consider Ordinance 2013 18. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Thank you. Any comments? In addition to that, <laughs> <laughs> well, I would uh, I would say that as chairman of the LUEA, we've been working very closely with Dennis's office and uh, and some in the chamber. Uh, well, the Greater Lafayette Commerce, Commerce, sorry, uh, very closely to put this cooperative uh, collaborative effort together. I think it's very exciting. It's a sort of a new uh, new age kind of a thing that we're doing, but I think that it's good for the neighborhood. It's good for the community. Hopefully it will develop and spark um, internet uh, interest and everything else that those folks do on their computers. And Dennis can explain more about it. But I think it's a really neat. Do my whole presentation here. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Dennis Carson, economic development director of the City of Lafayette. I've got a short presentation for you and some comments by the mayor. So if we'd like to um, move, so I can bring the screen down and not hit your head. Okay, go on. <laughs> No, no, no. Oh, I know. We just can't handle it. You got enough room? Either use the mic too or do that. Get up with a room, yeah. I'm ready. Yeah. Okay. Again, I'm Dennis Carson, Economic Development Director for the City of Lafayette, and I'm very excited tonight to tell you about an economic development initiative that they, we've been working on for some time now, and it's called Matchbox, which is a co-working studio, which is a shared place to work and create. Our community, like many others across the nation, have been discussing how do we keep and attract talent in a creative class? How do we foster entrepreneurism and create a culture or ecosystem around startups and in innovation? Um, so much so that in the, about a year ago, Greater Lafayette Commerce with the support of the two cities and the county and the, with the help of Rebecca Ryan, a consultant, created the Good to Great Report to look at these things and how to, again, how do we attract and retain talent, um, young talent, um, 
and all the way through retirees and such, and how do we keep them here in our community. Specifically, the report states to support the region entrepreneurs, hackers, makers, and support Lafayette Tech, a local nonprofit dedicated to supporting technology and entrepreneurship and investigate the feasibility of a hackerspace and makerspace, or what we like to call a co-working studio. So what is this space and how did it start? The co-working space we are developing is part office and part event space, but more importantly, it's about community and collaboration. This co-working space is for entrepreneurs and by entrepreneurs. This will be a physical space to do business, create business, innovate, collaborate, and share among members who explore all kinds of creative thought and ideas in an intentional community. For the mayor, for the mayor and I, this all started about 18 months ago when we attended a Lafayette Tech event and it was called Startup Weekend, which over a two and a half day period, starting on Friday and ending on the Sunday, over 60 ind individuals came from the greater Lafayette region to actually develop a full business over the weekend. So it, again, it started on a Friday, and the people that were there were from all over the area. Some from the community, some were Purdue students, some were faculty, some were, were from as far away as Denver, Colorado. They started out with 10 ideas, they narrowed it down to five, and then those five, they um, put together teams around those ideas and over the weekend created a full business plan and a presentation. On, on Sunday night, I went to the presentation part and where they pitched their ideas and I was very impressed. They were very viable ideas that you could actually see happening and the presentations were incredible. They were very professional and very, um, very well done. So I knew this was something that we really had to support here. We really had something very important going on in our community. So I started working with Lafayette Tech um, about how do we create more of this and support these kind of ideas. And what we settled on was to create a co-working space. So I've been working with now President Michael Berger at Lafayette Tech and many others to create this. So our plan. Our plan is to draw together creative people pursuing new ideas, such as software developers, designers, strategists, artisans, writers, makers, entrepreneurs of all types. We want to do this to create um, one kind of create a, a wide variety of people and these are the types of folks that like to, to be in a community of collaboration and share among themselves. So we're going to do this and refurbish an existing building following this co-working model, which is going to be the Stein building over by the library, and then we'll form or designate an organization to operate a multi-level membership-based community. The not-for-profit partner for this endeavor is going to be the Lafayette Urban Enterprise Association, which is chaired by Steve Meyer, and then also Greater Lafayette Commerce, which is the umbrella organization for the Urban Enterprise Association and several other organizations We'll also do the back office um, operations for the co-working studio. And then we'll hire a staff person to oversee the operations and facility. The space itself, again, is the Stein Building, which is right next to the Tippecanoe County Public Library. And it's right there on, um, if you know where the, the historic gas, Jonesy gas station is, it's actually the Walter Gray Building right there behind it. We have about 10,000 square feet. And the way that when we build this out, the way it will look in the center of it will be a very large open area for people to come in, find a desk, um, do their work, and collaborate among others. And then we'll also have um, an area for events and a, an area for dedicated desks. So for a different level of membership, you can actually have your own reserved desk. And we'll also have some small offices for some uh, small businesses of two to ten folks. Uh, conference rooms, and we'll have what we call a maker shop, which are those folks who like to make things and tinker. So we'll have a um, um, laser cutter in there, 3D printer, and other tools. And of course, entrepreneurs need coffee, so we'll have lots of coffee in a kitchen. <laughs> and with your approval, we hope the City of Lafayette will fund the renovation and the build out and the operation. We've been working on this since last November. We had a lot of um, involvement from a broad cross section of folks throughout the community. The public sector has been represented by myself and the mayor, and also by the Tidney County Public Library, Josh Holman, the County Library, and Van Phillips. On the not-for-profit not technology and entrepreneurship side, Lafayette Tech, with Michael Berger as president. Higher education has been at the table, Purdue University with Rick Kozer from the Burton Morgan Center, Jerry McCartney and Diana Hancock from the Innovation and Commercialization Center, Purdue Research Foundation with Tim Peoples, and Ivy Tech with Sherry Shipley. And then the business private sector represented by Greater Lafayette Commerce, Joe Seaman. And then we're under contract with um, Jason Tennant House with his company, Gray Mob. We are now in the design and strategy phase. Um, we have developed a full business plan, the financial model, with, with the help of Rick Kozer and some graduate students at Purdue University. We, have, we know what our budget is going to be, and we have a plan for sustainability over a three-year period. 
working on the space planning of the and the build out of the space, which includes working with our core architects and Kettle Hawk Construction. The branding and marketing has been done. Jason Tennant House has done that with the name of the Matchbox, and the marketing goes along with that. We're working now with on developing the services and technical assistance. A lot of that will be done through Lafayette Tech through many different events that we'll hold at the at the site. But we'll also um, bring in Purdue University, IB Tech, and we'll have local folks from attorneys, bankers, accountants. We'll have office hours there to provide assistance as well too. We've got the job description dump, our operations manager. We have the membership tiers. Again, you can come in at a base level where you can just share space and you just find an open desk to a reserve desk to an actual small office and then the maker space as well too. And then we're fine tuning the management and governance with the Urban Enterprise Association. We're on a very aggressive timeline. We meet about a couple days a week on this and then we're planning to open this in the, in the fall of this year. Over the past several months, we've held several user group meetings. And the first one we held was um, back in March on the worst day um, of the season. We had the highest snowfall of, of the winter. We held it at Sunday night at 8 o'clock. And I was really strongly encouraged about how many people came out for that. We had 20 people come out that evening, another 22 that were going to come, but they had canceled because of the weather. So since that time, we've had a couple other meetings, and we've had about 25 to 40 people each time. So been very encouraged about the interest in the space. So where will the next big idea come from? Well, I think it's going to come right here in, in Greater Lafayette. It's going to come right out of this um, co-working studio called Matchbox. That's our plan to help support this um, community and help the startup community here in, in Greater Lafayette through this co-working studio. So our intention is to help create a pipeline of entrepreneurship where folks can maybe, maybe they'll start at, at home Sometimes you see these folks at the coffee shop doing their business, but they'll also be able to move into this co-working space, work among people that, that are like themselves, that share um, the same like ideas, and create their business, and then graduate from this space and move out to a space into the downtown or onto their office park or the Purdue Research Park. So we're very, again, very excited about this, and we'll think this will really support entrepreneurism and help us attract and retain the creative class and all kinds of um, talent within our community. So with that, I'll turn it over to the mayor for a few words. Back to yours. Well, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen of the council, um, as Dennis said, this really is an exciting day, I believe, for the city of Lafayette. It's an important step for us as we really look at, at, at several things. One is how do we expand, expand our economic development infrastructure. You know, we do a lot of things in advanced manufacturing uh, here in our community, but how do we work to really expand that, that, that infrastructure and technology? How do we look at, as Dennis said, keeping that, that talent we have in the community with the kids in our high school at Purdue, at Ivy Tech, how do we keep them here in Lafayette? And Dennis made reference to that good to great uh, study that was done by Greater Lafayette Commerce, and this is one of the recommendations in that. But as Dennis said, probably even more importantly than that for me is that first weekend that I was invited by Lafayette Tech to what they call that startup weekend, I can be, I'll be honest, I, I knew virtually nothing about that. Um, I went because I was invited and I felt like it was a group I should probably support. Uh, but I really walked into that building knowing absolutely nothing about what was taking place. And I walked in, terrible location, hard to get into, um, stairs, small rooms, and the place was absolutely packed. And uh, there were people in there working in teams. And that those teams were creating ideas. They were creating business models. And people within those teams had different skills and abilities. And they were collaborating and sharing those ideas. And they were talking about business plans and applications uh, for different technologies. And uh, it didn't take me very long to know that something very important was happening at this weekend. So I called Dennis from there. And I said, Dennis, it's Tony. I said, look, here's where I'm at. I don't fully understand what's going on here, 
but something big is happening and we need to be a part of this. Um, so Dennis came out and, and he kind of told the rest of the story. And really, this program, the project started from that point and what was in that report. There, in the report, there is tons of talent in this community. And there, the next great idea it doesn't have to come from the East Coast. It doesn't have to come from the West Coast. It can come from right here in Greater Lafayette. Literally, we have people here in our community and from all over the world that come here. And the next great idea can come here. And what this space will allow us to do is to create that ecosystem of entrepreneurship, innovation, collaboration, and creativity that will let people know that this is a place to come to create a business, take a chance, take a risk. There's a community and an infrastructure here uh, that will support you. And so I really look at this uh, opportunity here as economic development. It's no different to me than giving a, a company in a tax abatement or uh, incentives through our TIF districts to move equipment or to do things like that. We're investing in education. We're investing in economic development. Um, we're investing in our young people to keep them here, to use that talent. And as I said at caucus, I think there's going to be some wonderful side benefits also. I think this is going to be great for downtown. I think it's going to be great for the near downtown neighborhoods as we have this going, if we have people coming in and out of the neighborhoods that want to live here, that want to stay here. Uh, as you probably know, Passage uh, Ways, which is a company that's recently moved to downtown, is a tech company. And part of the reason they did that was because of this co-working space. They want to be close to talent. They were over at the Purdue Research Park in the basement of the Purdue Federal Credit Union, and now they're in downtown Lafayette. And I think that, you know, I think that speaks volumes for what we want to do here. So we appreciate uh, your support uh, on this bond issue. Um, as I said at, at the Redevelopment and Economic Development Commission, we're in, we all know this, but we're in a global economy. We're in a global economy for every job we create, every job we retain, every talented person we either draw to our community or we keep in our community. We're competing with everyone uh, around the world. And in global economics, you are either going forward or you're going backwards. There is no treading water and just standing still because it's that competitive. And I know all of you feel like myself, the city of Lafayette will never go backwards. We will be progressive and we will move forward and we will push ourselves out to do what we need to do uh, to be successful. And a lot of that I owe to many of you around the table working together with me. Uh, not to digress too far, but you know, during the slowdown in the economy, what was our goal here? We said we'd keep doing water, we'd keep doing infrastructure, we'd do sewer, we'd do roads. We wouldn't roll up uh, the sidewalks. We'd push ourselves out of this and work to grab market share when the economy improved. And with the announcements of Nanshan and Alcoa uh, and all the announcements that we've had, the 400 million here recently of Subaru, uh, we've been able to do this. And this is another step in being progressive, being a leader, stepping out in front, and getting something done that can help change the dynamics in our community. So uh, we greatly appreciate uh, your support on this. Uh, one thing that I think you probably do all know by now, but WinTech is our first kind of uh, corporate sponsor, and they are sponsoring a one gigabyte pipe uh, that will be there, and they're donating that. Uh, and that is a large, large expense that we will not have, and we will have tremendous uh, internet capabilities with that wonderful donation from uh, WinTech. So we certainly want to publicly again uh, thank them. I want to thank the Tippecanoe County Public Library for being such a great partner uh, on this project with us, uh, getting that facility. And uh, certainly want to uh, uh, thank everybody from Purdue, the Purdue Research Park, and everybody. It's taken a lot of people to bring this to this point uh, that we're here now. And I want to thank them and certainly Dennis Carson's leadership uh, for really taking it by the horns here and, and finding a way to get this put together. So with that, Ed, I think would we like to turn it over to Lisa Lee first to, to discuss the uh, legal part of how this bond is set up. So uh, Lisa, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Good evening. My name is Lisa Lee with Ice Miller serving as bond counsel uh, on this project. You have in front of you ordinance number 2013-18. To give you a little bit of an idea of, of what we have gone through so far, on June 27th, the Economic Development Commission held a public hearing 
on this project. They also uh, approved what we call a project report and a resolution uh, with this bond ordinance attached, making a recommendation to the council to move forward with the bond issue. Also on June 27th, your redevelopment commission uh, pledged tax increment from your Creasy Tree suballocation area uh, to repay the, the debt service on these bonds. And I know your financial advisor is here and can talk more about uh, that situation. So these would be proposed to be payable solely from your tax increment, not from any other revenues of the city. They would not be any kind of general obligation of the city, and in no way uh, would they involve a new tax levy. So just start with that. Uh, the bond ordinance you have in front of you is what we consider a parameters ordinance. So as you go through here, uh, you'll see in section five, and this is really the only one I'm going to go point to uh, specifically, but on page three in section five, uh, this is really what you are looking at approving uh, in your next meeting, I believe, if you move this forward to your August 5th meeting. But you'll see there in Section 5, you're looking at approving a total principal amount not to exceed $1.5 million, uh, maturing no later than 10 years, and then uh, subject to optional prepayment, hopefully on any date that's up to negotiation with uh, hopefully your local banks. But it, uh, in no way longer than two years after the bonds are issued. That is, if you uh, feel that you want to go ahead and pay those off and, and you have the money to do that, you should be able to do so. Um, we call it a parameters ordinance because if the project came in at $1.6 million for some reason, uh, we could not issue bonds in $1.6 million without coming back to the council. We couldn't issue an 11-year bond or a 10.5-year bond without coming back to the council. And you would see on the next page, section six, just the top, you'll see uh, two interest, maximum interest rates. And again, your financial advisor can speak to these really uh, being very conservative. The 6% is if the bonds are taxable. We're kind of in this middle state here where we're trying to determine whether we can issue them as tax exempt or whether the flexibility with some of the things that you want to do are going to be better for you to issue taxable. And your financial advisor is going to work with your banks to see if that really makes a big financial difference, uh, if the flexibility is worth it more than the cost. 4% um, is the maximum if they're tax exempt. But again, I think uh, Lauren will go through that with you. The only other thing I really kind of want to just point out to you is the way these, this particular bond structure is handled, the city is the issuer of the bonds, and the bond proceeds are provided uh, to the LUA um, after they submit invoices and things to the controller. So the controller will see the invoices for the project costs, will review those, will we'll con uh, consult with whomever the controller needs to consult with to make sure, in fact, that work has been done, those materials have been delivered, et cetera, and then the controller can pay out those funds uh, directly for the project costs. So it's not there is some level of control. You're not just handing the 1.5 million directly to the LUA, you, you will maintain some control over that. Okay, That's very quick uh, and dirty what the bond issue is. Um, again, I can go ahead and bring up Ms. Mathis uh, to talk a little bit more about the financial side and then can certainly answer any questions uh, on the legal side. I'm handing out, I'm sorry, I'm Lauren Mathis from Umba. Um seen you guys before. <laughs> Good to see you again. Um, this is basically just a draft term sheet that we put together, which we will use um, on behalf of the city to talk with some of the local banks to see um, if they're interested in purchasing um, these proposed bonds. And it basically serves as sort of a summary for you right now of some of the terms that Lisa Lee just described that are in all those legal documents. Um, so this is sort of the Cliff Notes version for you who don't want to read all those legal documents. So, um, so that describes the bond issue, um, the issuer, the city of Lafayette, the um, Lafayette Urban Enterprise Association and their role, the purpose of the bonds to um, do the improvements at the co-working space, 
and um, also the financial structure, as Lisa just described it. Um, so I'm not going to repeat all that. Um, the terms are are detailed in here as well. The maximum amount, the interest rate, maximum interest rates. Again, as Lisa mentioned, we anticipate these to be the high, higher rates, and we're hoping that the rates will be lower than this. We just, again, are, they were setting the maximum parameters. Um, a placement fee not to exceed 2% of the par. On the second page, there's the maximum term not to exceed 10 years, and you'll see that when we've done an illustrative structure that we think these could be paid off in five years or even less. Um, just a lot of details on the different terms. Um, sort of toward the middle of the page, it talks about the TIF revenues, and as Lisa said, these bonds would solely be paid back from the Creasy Tree suballocation TIF revenues, which are on parity. There's one bond issue that's outstanding now, um, and that is the bonds that we just refunded um, earlier this year, the lease rental bonds of 2013. Um, we anticipate this would be partly, we are doing this fairly quickly to meet this aggressive timetable, um, but we also believe that you have, we have a history of working with some of your local banks have always stepped up and um, with a lot of these financings and they, they will, we feel like they already understand the TIF, they're familiar with the area, they understand the Urban Enterprise Association and their role with the city. Um, and so um, we are hoping we can work out this with them. Um, at good interest rates, um, and that way we would save um, extra expenses um, in terms of some of the underwriting type costs or the in the ratings and things like that. Um, then there's just some information on contacts. When this gets finalized, after um, we work through the details with the purchaser, then this will get into a final form and we'll attach these various um, documents that it says will be attached. But right now, we just put some illustrative schedules to give you an idea of what this looks like. And so, if a maximum of a million five is issued, um, we showed what the net, the net proceeds are anticipated to be and how those would be used. And then on the second to last page is an illustrative amortization schedule, which is the schedule that shows how the bonds would be paid back. And you'll see that it's a sem we're showing semi-annual payments, um, and they look it looks a little odd if you're used to looking at amortization schedules because what we were trying to do, if you look at the very last page, is um, meld this with the outstanding bonds so that the far right column is going to show is going to end up being a little more level. Um, the the outstanding structure put to, along with this structure then makes it a little more level, and you'll see that there's plenty of estimated TIF from Creasy Trees that would cover the payback. And again, you can see why we think that the bonds would get paid back within about five years. Um, but you can see that if, it, if we paid it back at a little bit longer term, we have plenty of excess um, TIF revenue projected to cover both the bond, the bond issue that's outstanding and these proposed bonds. And with that, does anybody have any questions? I do. Mr. Meyer? Yeah. Um, Lauren, just so that I understand this last page, so this is the combination of the outstanding debt, the bond that we just refinanced, I think. Yes. And the new payments for this new bond. Right. Right. So right. And it may be that we ish these bonds may end up being one term bond. If a bank buys them, they may just want to say it's all one term do and we'll have these may be sinking fund payments. So what we wanted to do is get feedback from them on the, the term, the structure and the interest rates. And as Lisa said, to find out the difference between um, if these were taxable versus tax exempt and then go back and talk with the city to see um, because it depends exactly on how they fine tune the use of the proceeds and some things like that. So this is why I use the word illustrative because this is potentially how we see it paid back, but we wanted the feedback. Because if it makes a significant difference in the interest rates, we might structure it just slightly differently. But so potentially, if if uh, if you were follow the schedule, do I understand we'd have both bonds paid back, paid off by 2025? Yeah. Is that how I'm reading? And this one might be paid off by 2018. <coughs> okay. And still leaving a lot uh, surplus, a, a lot of uh, surplus in it, in case other projects come along. I guess right. that was my. Which I'm I was guessing wondering. that I know that. 
Dennis always has lots of projects in mind. <laughs> he likes to dream. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, technically, we do not, as a firm, we're independent financial advisors, and we are to be really careful because we are not brokers. Um, and so, especially under some of the new rules that are going, um, are being um, proposed right now, we want to be really careful. So we will involve somebody from the city, like Dennis or Mike Jones, in conversations with the banks and us um, on your behalf. Jones, uh, you were mentioned as being in charge of the expenditures. Governmental It'll run through our normal uh, accounts payable process, which will go to the Board of Works for approval on all of those uh, invoices once they've gone through the approval process from from the people in charge of the project and so on. That is correct. Thank you. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions? I had one. Yes, sir. Or go ahead. Go ahead. You can ask the same one I am. Since we, since we are, since we are the city, of, uh, as representatives of the city of Lafayette, do tend to want to strike while the iron is hot. Are you sure you don't want us to entertain a motion to do read this twice tonight? I'm talking to the mayor. No, I don't. I don't think that's necessary because, as as Lauren and, and Lisa talked about, is we're going to be uh, negotiating with local banks, and I think because the uh, TIF is so strong, and, and uh, Lauren can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm thinking there was like 3,000% coverage or something. I mean, it's just incredibly strong that I, I don't think that that will be an issue. I certainly appreciate uh, you bringing that forward. Uh, that is something we've done in the past under very, very extreme circumstances, and it, it's paid off, actually. We did suspend the rules on one previous refinancing, and that's... Uh, uh, was very, and I'll grab that sheet that Mr. Jones, because it did get brought up in, uh, it did get brought up at the redevelopment position about the not bank qualified uh, because we went over the uh, $10 million uh, mark of bonds uh, when we did the refinancing, but and Mr. Jones prepared uh, a document for me that showed the redevelopment bonds the parks bonds and the water pollution control where we suspended the rules and those refinancing will save us eight million three hundred and five thousand one hundred and three dollars and zero cents so certainly there are times when that's extremely appropriate and our savings is going to be extremely substantial this probably does not fall into that category at this particular time but uh, thank you for Offering that potential availability, but it won't it won't be necessary. I have a question of Mr. Carson or the mayor. Um, just an idea of what other uh, shared spaces are are doing. Is it like half applications for smartphones? I mean, you don't want to limit it to anything. I know any ideas. Of and I mean, I, you know, Dennis and I have had the opportunity to met, to visit Launch Fishers. We've had the opportunity to visit 1776. In Washington D.C., we visited. Is it 1861? 1871, the year of Chicago Fire. That's what they named theirs after. After, so we've had the opportunity to uh, visit those, and Dennis has even visited some others. And it, it, it's a wide variety of people working on, uh, you know, a lot of apps and different applications to other uh, technology-based businesses, but not necessarily an app. Uh, one of the interesting stories that I'll just share with you is when we were at Launch Fishers, they had a little uh, co-working studio off to the side, a reserve space that we talked about, and that company uh, had developed an app for uh, convention and visitors bureaus, and they had outgrown their space and needed a little bit more, but they weren't ready to break into the higher end rental space, and uh, their first customer was Tippecanoe New County. And they, they brought that to our attention. So well, you ought to be located in Lafayette, then, if yeah. New <laughs> County was your first customer. Welcome. But uh, yeah. so it's, it's, it, it is it is a wide variety of activities, all the way down to uh, up at Chicago, 
University of Northwestern, University of Chicago, all have suites in there already. The universities, as Dennis said, there were several law firms that were sponsors uh, that had offices set up for office hours for the different to give advice on business development uh, and then some financial advisors. So it, it is a wide variety of people working together on a lot of different ideas in the support system to help those ideas become reality and people continue to take that development to the to the next level. Our hope is they grow out of the co-working space and have to go over to Purdue to the research park or have to get some other space here in, in Lafayette and we have that support system to help them achieve those goals. So then an attorney that would go there would know, they'd want someone with patent law, right? Anybody with a business plan would want financial yep. capital compensation stuff. Yeah, but that's going to cost the, the law firm because they have to be a sponsor. <laughs> the problem with the copyright of this name with the Cub Scouts, Matchbox Derbies, and Matchbox. Pinewood. Pinewood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you threw me there for a minute, Mr. Campbell. <laughs> <laughs> I think you yeah. have to call it cause Matchbox Derby. Yeah. I remember that. <laughs> that was a little kid. Good enough. All right. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Any, any other questions? Any <laughs> questions <laughs> by members of the audience? There being none, would the clerk then conduct a roll call vote on Ordinance 2013-18. Heidi? Aye. Clinker? Aye. Meyer? Aye. Reynolds? Aye. Brown? Aye. Allersmeyer? Aye. Williams? Aye. Sorry, Downing? Aye. Ordinance passes 8-0. Thank you. Ordinance 2013-19. In order to amend the Zoning Ordinance of Tippecanoe New County, Indiana, Uzo Amendment Number 77. It's a pleasure of the Council. Mrs. Williamson. I move for passage of Ordinance 2013-19 on first and final reading. Mr. Downing. Second. Comments by members of the Common Council. Anyone in the audience wish to make a presentation concerning this rezone? Just for the public's sake, should we mention that it's just extending the date on the on the spectrum to be this is, this is just an extension uh, which would have expired uh, today uh, to December the 31st. Just to <coughs> just an extension to the existing ordinance, and it's also passed 12 to zero at the. Any comments by members of the audience? Would the clerk then conduct a roll call vote on Ordinance 2013-19? Heidi? Aye. Clinker? Aye. Meyer? Aye. Reynolds? Aye. Brown? Aye. Allersmeyer? Aye. Williamson? Aye. Downing? Aye. Ordinance passes 8-0. Thank you. Ordinance 2013-20. In order to amend the zoning ordinance to Tippecanoe New County, Indiana, to rezone certain real estate from PDRS to R1B, Schumann Properties, Petitioner Brittany Chase, PD. Mr. Brown? Mr. President, I move that we hear and approve Ordinance 2013-20. Sir Heidi? Second. Comments or questions by members of the Common Council? Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Members, ladies and gentlemen of the Council, Dan Teeter, Attorney of Rowdy Teeter and Schreier, represent the petitioner. We're requesting in this case a rezone from PDRS to um, R1B. It's approximately 20 acres. It's located north of Veterans Memorial Parkway and just west of Concord Road. Um, this is the last phase of Brittany Chase, and I wanted to show you how we were designing that for a potential uh, a subdivision within that subdivision. We received favorable staff recommendation. We received the unanimous approval from the Area Planning Commission as well for this. Uh, this plan development is in abandonment, and as a result, it needs to be rezoned. Uh, no development can occur to it until it has been rezoned. Obviously, that's why we're here this evening to ask for your favorable request for this. Uh, we're going to decrease the number of lots in this subdivision from 106 to 91. All the amenities and all the roadways are going to stay in place. Nothing else will change. Uh, what's happened is that we're going to basically have the lots be R1A and R1B lots. R1A are 7,500 square foot of area. 
and 60 feet of lot width, R1B, or 6,000 and 50 foot of lot width. What we had in the old abandoned PD were 50 foot wide lots, generally speaking. So we're basically increasing the size of the lots and lessening the number of lots. Um, I think it's the reason for that is it was a planned development. It's difficult when you do a planned development, especially one this large, to predict the future. We couldn't predict the future correctly. The, uh, the marketplace has changed. And I would state to you that it would seem to me, it's my opinion, that planned developments have not been working very well for subdivisions. It works better as the conventional financing because the timing of it is more years and the product that you want to use is more years as well. And that seems to work very well. Uh, we have no objection from any of the surrounding property owners or neighbors. Uh, we would respectfully request your approval. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Mr. Klinker, uh, did I hear you say to R1B and R1A? No, it's just R1B. Okay. But the lots within this subdivision will be a combination of R1A and oh, R1B. Oh, the existing ones are A. No, the ones that we're going to do okay. are going to be that combination. We had to rezone it to R1B to get those lots, and then a few of them are R1A as well. Okay. So that's the combination. Before it was a PD that really fit into the old R1B designation somewhat, but there was much smaller lots, so we're increasing basically the lot width, a few of the square footages as well, but it's more of the lot width. It's, and so I'm bringing you that to kind of show you what's being done. And so this other picture you gave us is what it's going to look like now, even though it says planned development down here. This is right. That was I just trying to give you a conceptual. Uh, that process is going to start shortly on that. The lots will look uh -huh. like this. Yes. Existing. Okay. Yes, ma'am. What's approximately your occupancy of um, the phases adjacent to this property? Are they are they all developed completely yes. full? Yes. Everything else is developed in this. This is the very last phase. Everything else is done. Uh, would you help me get oriented for this? Uh, Veterans Memorial Parkway, what is on either side uh, of this a street that I can identify with? Concord Road is to the east of it. Veterans Memorial Parkway is south of it. Okay, so you've got the, what I'll call the Burger Doodle Strip in there, and then just north of that, you would have this subdivision. It's without offending anybody that has something other than a Burger Doodle in there. <laughs> Any other questions by members? Yes, Mr. Meyer. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Teeter, are they mostly going to be rentals or single owner occupied? These are owner occupied. I, I'm sure there is a rental in there of some sort, but the subdivision is basically owner occupied. And do we know of the existing Brittany Chase that exists there? Do we have any idea of how much are they all single yes. owner occupied or rental? My understanding is that's all owner occupied. Again, I thought that's what you were referring to. There may be some. Reynolds in there, but I'm unaware of very many. I think that's all on our part. And that's the intent here as well. And can they rent, though, under this designation? They could. If sure, they sure. Any subdivision in the city could rent uh, under any zoning designation unless it's a PD and it had something in its uh, homeowners association that said you could not rent, or the restrictions would say that, but I'm aware of that. Yes, Mr. And Kinsley. you said the PD expired, so it's been a while. Um, do these Superintendent of school, the school systems know that, or will, or do you predict that this will increase the speed of this filling out now? I, I think the product's a better product. Uh, I think the developer is, is praying that it will do that. Uh, I don't know what the future will bring, but right now the uh, single-family housing market, even with the interest rates having gone up, is still very strong, and it uh, looks like it continues to be strong. But you know, if I could predict the future, I wouldn't be here. Is there so. is there a <laughs> is there a mechanism to uh, tell the school system that it could be growing faster? Or they just have to keep. Well, I think they them? they're more probably more aware of that than we are. I mean, they're uh, the school systems that I've seen. You know, the Lafayette ones are very much in tune to what this developer is doing because they work together within the their school districts and generally provide a space or an area that they can purchase or at a discount or given to them for uh, part of their school operations. So I think they know what, what we're doing. They know that the <laughs> lots were going to be more. Now they're going to be a little less. How that's going to grow, I really can't answer that. So. Inside the parkway, is it Lafayette? 
there? Yes, it's, yeah. this is Lafayette. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions that I can answer? The average price of a home being constructed there? I don't know that I can answer that. I would say uh, 150 maybe. Okay. Uh, but I, I'm guessing on that. I'm, you know, it's been a while since I've been out to that development. I could be low low hundreds is probably accurate. Okay. But reasonable. Thank Any you. other questions? Members uh, of the audience, do you have any questions? Yes, sir. Boyd Wells, 3717 Rawlings Drive. Isn't that property out in the vicinity of Staley's? No? Am I? Not real close. No, I'm talking about the South Staley's. You know what frozen custard is off that memorial Right? Out in that area. Yeah, behind Hunter's I was, Club. And you were talking about Concord Road, and it seemed to me like it was stately. So, oh, no problem, no problem, man. I just sound to me like problem brewing. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments or questions by members of the audience? And would the clerk then conduct a roll call vote on Ordinance 2013-20? Heidi. Aye. Flinker. Aye. Meyer. Aye. Reynolds. Aye. Brown? Aye. Allersmeyer? Aye. Williamson? Aye. Downey? Aye. Ordinance passes 8 to 0. Thank you. Ordinance 2013-21. An ordinance to amend the zoning ordinance of Pickney County, Indiana, to rezone certain real estate from I-3 to GB, Seed North Fleet Petitioner, 20.455 acres on Maple Point Drive. Thank you. What's the pleasure of the council, Ms. Williamson? I move for passage of Ordinance 2013-21 on first and final reading. Second. Down and got you. <laughs> <laughs> On it. What'd you do, not Jim? Yeah. <laughs> We're working together. We're a oh. team. Oh, good. Okay, good. Team players. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions or comments by members of the Common Council? Mr. <coughs> yeah, Mr. President. Oh. Yes. Uh, this was brought again before the Area Plan uh, Commission, and this was again approved 12 to 0 uh, approval. <laughs> Sir. Mr. Campbell, again, Dan Teeter for the record. I uh, appreciate the opportunity. I uh, represent Petitioner Steve Northfleet is present this evening. Uh, Steve would respond to any comments or questions that you might have on this. Uh, we're requesting rezone from I-3 to GB. I'll try to be a little more specific for you as to where it's located. Uh, this is south of Maple Point Extension and west of Sagamore Parkway, and that's why I gave you the handout to show you on the zoning map precisely where that is. And as Mr. Reynolds indicated, we have a favorable staff report, unanimous staff or APC approval as well. The handout shows you on that map that we're surrounded by I-3 on the west, GB on the east, GB on the north. There's also some I-3 on the south as well as floodplain on the south. Um, Maple Point Extension, in my opinion, has substantially changed that area. Obviously, we now have access to Sagamore Parkway. I was out there the other day, and uh, wow, I mean, it's unbelievable. It doesn't look like the same area anymore. It's, uh, the city's done a very nice job. The roundabout looks looks terrific. I think it's going to cause a lot of changes, as you're seeing already, to this area. Uh, for our site, and that's what the other drawing shows you, uh, we're going to have access off of Maple Point Extension, we're also going to have access off of uh, Sagamore Parkway as well. Uh, I want to read you a short excerpt from staff's report. They said that uh, south of Teal Road, the industrial uses to pe appear to be in, a, uh, in flux and ripe for different land uses. By rezoning a larger tract and then subdividing, we avoid the mixed use of other commercial areas. They're talking about the hodgepodge, for example, uh, Farabee has had a little bit of that hodgepodge. This seems to be a better approach from their standpoint, and we concur with them as well. We asked uh, uh, Lafayette engineers to take a look at uh, what we proposed, and they indicated to us uh, that they had no objections to this, and, and Jenny is here this evening. I think Bob is too, and they could respond if they would like to. We're showing a 18-lot subdivision uh, on this site. Petitioner indicates to me that 
there may be an opportunity for a large box use uh, user instead. Uh, we don't know that as yet, but this is just a, a conceptual layout that we think might work for this particular site. Again, we have no objections from any of the surrounding property owners. We would respectfully request your approval. Happy to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, Mr. Teeter. Yes. Sir. yes. Yeah, would you, you want to clarify that? Just for the council and, and, the, and the audience, or the the members, uh, the floodplain issue that came up, and okay. it's, it's kind of if you don't understand it, it's, it's kind of confusing. as I indicated, south of the site, it, it, there is some floodplain in there, and there is some I three. You'll notice to the right of uh, of our development, we show a jagged area in there. That area is zoned G B but it is in floodplain, so we are going to certify it out of GB back into floodplain so that in the future if we do develop this site and we are able to add to the area as far as, uh, as uh, putting uh, dirt or, or whatever fill in there, if we could do something like that, then that would take on that additional zoning of, uh, of GB to this site. So what you see for the proposed layout of it eventually will end up all being GB, but that is still uh, around that 20-some acres. Does that answer your question, Mr. Reynolds? Yeah, I just thought it ought to be clarified. In case you I, I guess I would have a question of the city engineer. C can you alter a floodplain? You're allowed to fill it in and do all those things <laughs> to it? Yes. Good news. <laughs> Good evening, Jenny Lushney, City Engineer. Um, yes, you can do that uh, with a permit through uh, the Department of Natural Resources. There's certain criteria that you have to meet in order to be able to fill in any portion of the floodplain. But um, with with permits, it is it is feasible to do that. Oh, and that would only go to the DNR. It would not come to this organization. No, it would go to the DNR if they issued the permit. Then we would um, consider that that could be filled in. They do hydraulic mo modeling of the stream and they determine whether this particular project will impact that and what, what percentage it might impact that particular area. And so that is all done through the DNR. So, so all of this area that is uh, floodplain, uh, would that impact if this organization were to fill that in, would that impact neighbors? And that's all evaluated in their modeling when they look at the at the potential flooding and what fill in that area would do. They they model that and determine the impact. They also have a public hearing process where they allow um, adjacent property owners to comment on that permit before it is issued. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I get a question real quick. So if the modeling says it's not okay, you need two more lots. There might have to be two lots given to retention, detention, ponds, whatever. Is that if, how that might If the modeling work shows that they cannot fill the floodplain, then Very the zoning stays the way that it is. Okay. If I could just add to that, the hatched area is what we're asking to re be rezoned. We just wanted to, to clarify with you what the rest is because there was some confusion in area plan that it, they said, well, that's zoned I-3. Well, it is zoned I-3, but it is in the floodplain, so it should have been zoned floodplain, and that's what they're correcting. You know, we're showing this as just a conceptual on this. We may or may not be able to do the 18 lots. As I've indicated, my client's working diligently to try to get a big box user in there. If he did that, the opportunity for using those remaining lots would not, probably not be necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Any uh, any other questions? Thank you. Any questions by members of the audience concerning this particular rezoning? There being none, would the clerk then conduct a roll call vote on Ordinance 2013-21? Heidi? Aye. Blinker? Aye. Meyer? Aye. Reynolds? Aye. Brown? Aye. Hollersmeyer? Aye. Williamson? Aye. Downing? Aye. We're going to pass this to zero. Thank you. 
Ordinance 2013-22. Ordinance amending sections within Chapter 3.04, Chapter 8.03, Chapter 13.01, and Chapter 13.02 as they pertain to inspections and fees. What's the pleasure of the council? I think maybe we ought to put this on the floor and then we ought to send it to the Ordinance Committee. Move to uh, consider Ordinance 2013-22. Second, Mr. Klinker. Second. Uh, do you have opposition to that? I do not. <laughs> Hold it down there. <laughs> I would entertain a motion to send this to the Ordinance Committee. So moved. Second. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, the same sign. It's with the Ordinance Committee, and they will keep us appraised of when we're going to have a meeting and the publication of those meetings. Okay? What? Anything else you need? No. Would you like me to talk a little bit about it? Uh, if you'd like to, I don't know. If it's, For the yeah. members of the public that maybe n not understand what, I would what we're asking they will for. I come just, to the meetings I would and uh, voice their opinions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> there are no resolutions. Reports of special committees. Reports by the mayor. Miscellaneous and new business. Reports of councilmen. Public comment. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. My name is Darren Lynn Carts. My address mm -hmm. is 1116 Hedgewood Drive in Lafayette. I wondered what the possibility would be to consider moving future Independence Day celebrations back to Slater Hill and the intramural field on the west side. What kind of celebrations? The Independence Day, Fourth of July, the fireworks stars and stripes, stars and stripes and concert oh, and everything. Um, I, I can't tell you. I would say that uh, many other uh, entities would have something to say about that. I, I'm guessing that it was sent to the Really Plaza for some reason. And, uh, it seems to me that there was maybe some construction going on on the west side when it first came over. Yes, sir. Oh, that's right. Um, okay, so there's the Stars and Stripes Committee that's in yeah. charge. Thank you. Both learned something. <laughs> <laughs> Any other public comment? Mr. If we did miss something on reports from Councilman, we, do we need to mention that the resolution? You, you, you could mention that you had a committee meeting. We had a happened. committee meeting for the uh, annexation committee and uh, had a recommendation on R2. It was a positive recommendation that uh, we allow R2 on multiple R2s on one lot, like an apartment would be R3 would have apartments on one. R2 will, can have multiple duplexes on one single lot. So, so, so where is that going? It will go to the Area Plan Commission and then they will – go ahead, Mr. It will it'll actually – what they voted on was for me to go ahead and, and file a resolution for the city council, the, the full council to consider at the August meeting. But uh, Mr. Klinker indicated what the resolution will recommend to the Area Planning Commission, but it'll come up to so the August So it's only going to go for a, 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 res a resolution from here resolution to the Area Planning Commission, and then they Correct. Any other questions? 
I, I just uh, I forgot to mention one thing. I think since we've met last, uh, there was a state baseball championship, <laughs> oh. Central Catholic, and oh. so I'd like to ask that the city council send a letter of commendation to Central Catholic, congratulating them. Thank you. Running out of fingers. Yeah. Beg your so they're running out of fingers for all yeah. those rings. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, Mr. Heidi. I move to adjourn. Se who's second? Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Yep. Same sign. Thank you very much.